So chapter 15 is over drug therapy for dysrhythmias. So first we have how the blood flows through the heart. So remember our blood carries oxygen and nutrients to the tissues, drops off the oxygen and nutrients in the tissues and picks up waste or carbon dioxide. So the right side of the heart gets that blood back after it has come from the body. So it's oxygen poor blood. It gets the heart or the blood back from the body and then sends it to the lungs where we drop off the carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen. The left side of the heart receives that oxygen rich blood from the lungs and then pumps it out to the body and it just continues on with this cycle. <clears throat> So the heart has a natural pacemaker. Um, the heart, again, it's a pump that is operated by its own electrical system that controls the rate and rhythm. The pacemaker or the sinoatrial or SA node controls the heart rate. It generates the electrical impulse that um, causes the atria on top of the heart to contract and sends the electrical signal to the AV node. So it's responsible for the rate and rhythm of the heartbeat. When that SA node doesn't function, the AV node takes over as the pacemaker of the heart. This secondary pacemaker usually causes about 40 to 60 electrical impulses per minute, which will give you a slower heart rate than that 60 to 100 that the SA node causes. So that AV node is a relay station that sends electrical signals to the His-Purkinje system that innervates the ventricles, causing them to contract and pump the blood out to either the lungs or the body, depending on which side of the heart we're talking about. Again, that normal rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. Um, the rate can vary based on what our needs are, right? If I'm running up and down a hill, then my needs for oxygen are gonna be higher, my heart's gonna beat faster because of that. If I'm sleeping, my needs for oxygen are going to be lower, so my heart rate will slow because of that. If both the SA and AV nodes don't work, the ventricular muscle cells become the third pacemaker of the heart, and you'll see a very slow heart rate, like 20 to 40 beats per minute. So normal sinus rhythm happens when an impulse begins in the SA node and travels like it's supposed to, okay? During activity, excitement, fever, or shock, your body needs more oxygen throughout the system, so it needs more oxygen-rich blood. So your heart, may, your heart rate might increase to 100 beats per minute or maybe even more, depending on the situation. Again, when you're resting or sleeping, your body needs less oxygen-rich blood, so your heart rate decreases, sometimes even less than 60 beats per minute. Some symptoms that could be caused by a decreased cardiac output are um, dizziness, lightheadedness, fainting, decreased peripheral pulses, and sometimes we have what we call premature beats. If these premature beats are frequent, cardiac output is going to be decreased. Um, some other things that can affect cardiac output are genetics, age, and medication. Um, these can actually cause a dysrhythmia. A dysrhythmia is any abnormal heart rhythm. Some dysrhythmias cause symptoms, some of them don't. The severity of a dysrhythmia can't be judged by the symptoms though. Um, that's important to know. So I mentioned premature contractions. These are premature atrial or ventricular beats. It might feel like the heart skips a beat. <clears throat> An occasional premature beat is usually not serious, but premature beats can lead to other serious dysrhythmias. When pre premature beats are frequent, cardiac output is going to be decreased. Um, some Common symptoms of any dysrhythmia would be chest pain, dizziness, fainting, a fluttering feeling in the chest, lightheadedness. Sometimes there's no symptoms, but sometimes there's a rapid heart rate, shortness of breath, or even a slow heart rate. Um, there are boxes in the book that list common dysrhythmias in, on page 267, and then symptoms and risk factors on 268. Um, so we talked about those premature contractions. We also have what we call fibrillation. That just means that the, the heart is quivering. If it's atrial fibrillation, the top part or the atria of the heart are just 
quivering. Um, it decreases the cardiac output because the blood is just kind of oozing into the ventricles. Um, it's not pumping effectively. And if it's a ventricular fibrillation, this is actually deadly. Um, the ventricles just quiver, so they're not pumping blood out to the lungs or out to the rest of the body. So the body's tissues are not getting blood. Um, this is deadly and it has to be defibrillated if we want to save the person. So um, I always, I learned this in nursing school and I'll remember it for the rest of my life. Um, V-fib equals D-fib. So if they're in ventricular fibrillation or V-fib, then they have to get defibrillated. So V-fib equals D-fib. So we have different medications for dysrhythmias to either increase or decrease the heart rate. It really just depends on what the dysrhythmia is. Um, the intended action is to decrease the spontaneous contraction of the heart cells, which would slow the ability of the heart muscle to transmit electrical impulses and prolong the refractory period of the heart cells. The refractory period is a period of time after an impulse generation where the normal stimulation would not cause another impulse. So I want that to be prolonged. Before I give any medication for antidysrhythmics, this is a very general um, you know, thing for all antidysrhythmics, and we'll get into the different drug classes in a minute. I want to know their baseline weight. Um, I want to know their heart rate, pulse, and cardiac rhythm, and their liver and kidney function. Um, and then I want to continue to monitor their heart rate and pulse um, and their cardiac rhythm as well and note any abnormalities. The actions of drugs that um, to treat rapid heart rates might be to decrease spon spontaneous contractions of the heart cells including the pacemaker cells um, that might be to slow the ability of the heart muscle cells from transmitting electrical impulses or prolong that refractory period, like I said. Um, a big thing to note is that antidysrhythmic drugs can cause other dysrhythmias. That's important to understand because I'm messing with the electricity in the heart, if you will, and if I'm trying to speed it up or slow it down, it could do that to the point where it gives um, the person another dysrhythmia. Teach your patients to avoid um, orthostatic hypotension. We've talked about that a lot this semester. Um, check and record their own heart rate and rhythm. Um, teach them to take the drugs exactly as prescribed, no double doses, to um, teach them to consult their prescriber before they take any other medications over the counter or prescription, keep their follow-up appointments and wear a medical alert bracelet saying that they have this dysrhythmia. So we're gonna talk first about atropine for Brady dysrhythmias. So Brady, anything means too slow, okay? Um, so the vagus nerve slows the heart rate. So atropine for a Brady dysrhythmia is going to block the action of that vagus nerve on the heart. It treats symptomatic bradycardia and asystole. So symptomatic bradycardia means a, a heart rate less than 60 with other symptoms. Okay. And then asystole is the absence of electrical um, activity okay, in the heart. The intended response is to increase the heart rate and cardiac output and decrease any dizziness. Um, in an emergency setting, atropine might also be given through an endotracheal tube or through an um, intraosseous route. Atropine increases heart rate and heart workload. It can also worsen heart ischemia on heart blocks. So that's important to know, okay? Um, side effects are tachycardia, because again, I'm increasing the heart rate. I could increase it too much. Um, drowsiness, dry mouth, blurred vision, urinary hesitancy or retention, and adverse effects would be um, ventricular fibrillation. That's rare, um, but it could happen. Remember, anytime I'm giving um, a medication to speed up the heart, it could do too much of it or more than I want it to. So um, there's a potential for those effects. Before I give atropine, I need to know the heart rate, blood pressure. I need to make sure that they have an IV site that works. And I wanna know if they have any vision problems like glaucoma because atropine can make this worse, okay? Um, I want to monitor heart rate, blood pressure, blood pressure IV site, um, pulse, urine output. Urinary retention can be a side effect of atropine. Atropine can also cause constipation. Um, so you know, we need to watch for that. Um, 
I want to ask them about any other side effects and assess their bowel sounds and abdominal tenderness um, because of that potential constipation. I want to teach my patient that um, you know, this medication is, is strong, it is um, very effective in increasing the heart rate, it may make them not feel very well, but it's not prescribed for long-term use. This is going to be in more of an emergency situation in the hospital setting. Um, if they do have a dry mouth, they can use mouth rinse. Um, I do want them to avoid strenuous activity and hot settings because atropine can affect the body's uh, um, ability to regulate heat. But again, this is going to just be a short-term medication while they're in a hospital setting. Um, atropine is a low to moderate risk for pregnancy and lactation. Um, IV atropine can cause tachycardia in the fetus, um, but again, we are going to give it if we are giving if mom needs it. This is going to be something um, that is going to prevent you know mom from or hopefully prevent mom from dying. So we have to save mom in order to have a viable baby, right? So um, even though there it can cause tachycardia in the fetus, we would just monitor fetus. We still would need to give this to mom if she needs it. Um, our older adults are at a greater risk for drug-induced myocardial infarction or heart attack, so they require extra close monitoring. Again, this medication is only something that we are going to give in a hospital setting, um, usually actually in an ICU, not even on a regular floor. So we're going to have close monitoring for any patient that receives this medication. Next, we have digoxin. So first, let's talk about atrial fibrillation. Um, their atrial fibrillation is when there's like a chaos um, with the AV node, that pacemaker of the heart. So the atria that sit on top are just quivering, okay? Um, the ventricular response is always going to be irregular with this. It can be slow, moderate, or rapid. Um, so we have the atria on top that are just kind of quivering, they're not effective, and then those, ve that, those ventricles on the bottom are just kind of trying to work. Um, it's, it's a little bit chaotic for, for the heart. Um, so the medication that we use often for atrial fibrillation is digoxin. Digoxin helps slow the heart rate by blocking the number of electrical impulses that pass through that AV node to the heart ventricles. It also helps strengthen the contractions in the ventricles so that the heart's able to pump more blood with each heartbeat. Um, in the past, we used digoxin a lot. We don't use it as much anymore. There's newer drugs that are prescribed, um, but you'll still see patients on digoxin. Um, there's a full discussion of action side effects and other issues related to digoxin back in chapter 14, so read through that if you need to. Um, so again, digoxin for a dysrhythmia slows, or atrial fibrillation specifically, slows and strengthens the heartbeat. The intended response is to decrease that heart, heart rate, increase contractility, and cardiac output. Um, so now we're going to talk about tacky dysrhythmias. Um, tacky dysrhythmias, tacky anything means too fast. So um, tacky dysrhythmias are arrhythmia, dysrhythmias that are too fast. Um, drugs for tacky dysrhythmias can either reduce the automaticity of the heart muscle, slow down the conduction of the electrical impulses through the heart, and pro or prolong the refractory period of the heart cells. Some of them do multiple um, actions. The goals of drugs for tachy dysrhythmias are to prevent and relieve symptoms, prolong life, and suppress abnormal rhythms. Um, class 1A sodium channel blockers treat premature ventricular contractions, supraventricular tachycardia, and ventricular tachycardia, and prevent ventricular fibrillation. They decrease the excitability of the heart muscle, slow the conduction of electrical impulses through the heart. Um, you can see the class 1A sodium channel blockers on um, page 273. The intended response is that decreased heart rate, decreased supraventricular and ventricular rhythms, increased cardiac output, and restore a normal rhythm. Side effects are hypotension, loss of appetite, abdominal cramping, diarrhea, and nausea. Um, disopyramide can cause constipation, dry mouth, urinary retention, and hesitation. Adverse effects of quinidine specifically is hypotension and torsades de point. That's a lethal um, heart rhythm. With procainamide, we worry about seizures, heart block, asystole, and decreased white blood cells. And with disopyramide, we worry about heart failure. 
as many as 30 to 50 percent of patients will develop um, GI side effects with these drugs. Less common side effects could be like dizziness, confusion, headache, fainting, blurred vision, um, tachycardia, rash, thrombocytopenia, bitter taste in the mouth, flatulence, dry eyes, or throat. Allergic reactions are rare but serious. Signs include fever, neutropenia, Raynaud's syndrome, muscle aches, skin rashes, blood vessel inflammation in the fingers. Um, so before I give these meds, I want, um, I want to note that they're best absorbed on an empty stomach with a full glass of water. If there are GI symptoms, you can give it with food to help with that, um, but I really would prefer if it was on an empty stomach. Um, after I give these, I want to monitor intake and output and daily weights because I want to watch for signs of heart failure. I want to ask them about upset stomach or diarrhea or anything like that. I want to teach them to monitor their urine output and daily weight on their own. Um, I want to teach them about any drug and food interactions and to monitor for swelling of the ankles and shortness of breath. In pregnancy and lactation, there's a low to moderate risk. Um, we typically do not give it, however, during pregnancy um, because we don't like any any sort of risk. Um, and this one is not like necessarily a life-saving um, emergency situation drug like atropine is. Um, so this is going to be something that we'd probably avoid in pregnancy and breastfeeding. In our older adults, um, they could hold on to more of the drug, retain it, um, eliminate it more slowly. So they're at higher risk for side effects and toxicity. Then we have our class 1B sodium channel blockers. These are on page 275. Um, most 1B sodium channel blockers inhibit the ability of the ventricles to contract prematurely. They decrease the number of PVCs or preventricular contractions and episodes of ventricular tachycardia. Class 1B sodium channel blockers treat PVCs, ventricular tachycardia, and prevent ventricular fibrillation. Um, so See, the intended response, again, is to decrease the risk of ventricular tachycardia, the number of PVCs, increase the cardiac output, and restore a normal rhythm. Side effects include confusion, drowsiness, dizziness, tremors, vertigo, tinnitus, and visual disturbances. Um, adverse effects with lidocaine specifically could be um, cardiac arrest. With mexilatine um, and tokenide, um, dysrhythmias could get worse with tokenide and fentoin neutropenia, and then with fentoin aplastic anemia and Steven Johnson syndrome. In an emergency setting, am amiodarone is the first line drug prescribed for ventricular tachycardia, followed by lidocaine. Lidocaine should never be used for patients with severe heart block um, dysrhythmias because the normal heart pacemaker is not functioning. Cardiac arrest can happen. So before I give these, I want to know if they're taking the supplement St. John's Wort. St. John's Wort can decrease the blood level of lidocaine in the blood. Um, I also want to make sure that they have a working IV site. I want to monitor for chest pain, shortness of breath, and for side effects. Ask patients if they've ever had problems with tremors, dizziness, lightheadedness, visual problems, or ringing in the ears, and watch for those side effects. Teach them to immediately report irregular rhythms, heart rates less than 60 beats a minute or more than 100 beats a minute, any chest pain, shortness of breath, or wheezing. Uh, we do not use these in pregnancy and lactation, and in older adults, they're prone to dizziness and falls and more likely to become confused, so we just have to monitor closely. Class 1C sodium channel blockers on page 276. Um, these slow the heart's electrical impulse conduction. The intended response is fewer episodes of ventricular and supraventricular dysrhythmias, increased cardiac output, um, fewer symptoms, and to restore a normal rhythm. We use these to treat life-threatening ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, to treat supraventricular tachycardia that is not responsive to other drugs, Side effects are more likely to occur with higher doses. This includes dizziness, conduction system abnormalities leading to heart blocks, altered sense of taste, constipation, nausea, vomiting. Flecainide can cause blurred vision and difficulty focusing. Adverse effects include supraventricular and ventricular dysrhythmias like heart blocks and ventricular tachycardia. Before I give these, I want to know if they have a history of bronchospasms because propafenone can um, cause worsening bronchospasms and that can um, 
so it's contraindicated. Um, after I give these, I want to monitor for dizziness, altered taste sensation, constipation, nausea, vomiting, and vision changes. Teach your patient to report visual disturbances, fever, sore throat, chills, any unusual bleeding or bruising, chest pain, shortness of breath, or excessive sweating. These symptoms indicate a life-threatening um, dysrhythmia or toxicity. And then class 1C, um, sodium channel blockers have a low to moderate likelihood of increasing the risk for birth defects or fetal harm, um, but I'm still only going to use them when the benefits outweigh the risks to the fetus, and I do want to avoid breastfeeding with these. In our older adults, there's a higher incidence of dizziness. There are increased risk for kidney or liver problems, so we're going to use these cautiously. Um, the next class that we're going to talk about is beta blockers. Um, you can see the beta blockers that we use on page 278. Um, refer back to chapter 13 for a full discussion of the drug class beta blockers. These decrease the heart rate and the force of the heart contractions, which results in a decreased blood pressure. As a result, the heart doesn't work as hard and requires less oxygen. Cardioselective beta blockers work only on the cardiovascular system. Non-cardioselective beta blockers have systemic effects. There is um, that table, like I said, in the book on page 278. Um, again, your beta blockers all end in, in LOL, and you can refer back to chapter 13 for the complete lecture on beta blockers. Then we have our class three potassium channel blockers to treat ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. These are on the bottom of page 278. Um, blocking potassium channels lengthens the duration of action potentials. Um, so here we're gonna use these to convert atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter to a normal sinus rhythm. This is going to slow the conduction through the AV node. The intended response is to decrease blood vessel constriction and heart rate increase blood flow to the coronary arteries and to the heart muscle, and slow electrical impulse conduction in all of the heart muscle tissues. Oral amiodarone is used to prevent recurrence of ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation, as well as to maintain a normal sinus rhythm after conversion from atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Side effects are dizziness, fatigue, malaise, bradycardia, hypotension, loss of appetite, constipation, nausea and vomiting, ataxia, involuntary movements, numbness and tingling, and poor coordination, and tremors. Um, amiodarone can cause photosensitivity, hypothyroidism, or hyperthyroidism. Um, these are likely to occur within the first few weeks of treatment. Patients who take amiodarone for long periods of time um, might develop blue discoloration of the face, neck, and arms, so that's something to note as well. Um, Adverse effects of amiodarone specifically are adult respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, um, pulmonary fibrosis, heart failure, worsening of heart dysrhythmias, decreased liver function, toxic epidermal um, necrolysis, and of dofetilide, um, chest pain, life-threatening ventricular dysrhythmias. Um, several potential life-threatening effects are associated with amiodarone. Toxic epidermal necrolysis is rare but life-threatening skin disorder that's caused by an allergic reaction. So some administration alerts, I want to monitor the respiratory status of the patient that takes amiodarone. Chest pain and life-threatening ventricular dysrhythmias are possible with dofetilide. Um, ibutilide might cause heart dysrhythmias. Signs of pulmonary problems include ARDS, um, including crackles when you listen to the lungs with a stethoscope, difficulty breathing, fatigue, cough, fever. Signs of thyroid problems include weight gain, lethargy, swelling in the hands, feet, or around the eyes. So I want to monitor their IV site, ask if they have history of renal problems with dofetilide, um, monitor their blood pressure, monitor for signs of pulmonary or thyroid problems, and follow up their labs and EKGs. Teach patients to wear protective clothing, protect themselves against that photosensitivity. Side effects might not appear for days or weeks. Um, Eye exams are needed every six to 12 months because of that potential photosensitivity. Um, report any, or take the drug exactly as prescribed and report any breathing changes, swelling, um, or adverse effects. We do not use these in um, pregnancy and lactation. Potassium channel blockers um, have a moderate to high likelihood of increasing the risk for birth defects or fetal harm, so we don't use them. Um, women who are breastfeeding should not use these drugs. If the treatment is necessary, breastfeeding should be discontinued. 
And then is the hot So calcium channel blockers, um, you'll see these on, um, let's see, page 280. Um, some examples are diltiazem and verapamil. We use these to treat supraventricular tachycardia. They slow the conduction of the SA and AV nodes of the heart, leading to decreased heart rate. Um, there is a full lecture on this in chapter from chapter 13, so refer back to that if you need to. And then we have adenosine, it's unclassified, it's on page 281. Um, it helps restore a patient to a normal sinus rhythm. Um, so adenosine, the intended response is a slower impulse conduction through that AV node, decreased heart rate, elimination of the supraventricular tachycardia. Um, side effects are facial flushing, shortness of breath, and transient dysrhythmias. Adverse effects, um, allergy, but that's rare, um, and we don't give it with a heart block unless the patient has a pacemaker um, in place because it can cause asystole. So if we give adenosine slowly, it's eliminated from the body before it can actually reach the heart. Um, so fatal cardiac arrest, sustained ventricular tachycardia, non-fatal myo myocardial infarction have happened with adenosine. So when we're giving adenosine, we have to give it very, very quickly. Quickly. We push it fast. We put the arm up in the air to help gravity get, get it there faster. Um, the patient actually goes into asystole for a moment and then the um, heart should go back into a normal sinus rhythm. So we literally stop their heart and then restart it with this medication. So before I give it, I want to prepare them for what it's gonna what's gonna happen. They're gonna feel like they got a big kick to the chest. We have to have emergency equipment available at the bedside. I want them on the monitor the whole time. I want to make sure that the IV works appropriately. Um, and I'm going to, like I said, educate them, prepare them for what it's going to feel like. I am literally stopping their heart and hoping that it will restart appropriately because it's in this crazy chaotic rhythm. I'm gonna stop it and hope that it picks up and, and does what it's supposed to from there. It's kind of like turning your computer off and then back on again, right? Um, but we're doing, we're doing that with the heart. So like I said, I'm pushing it rapidly over one to two seconds, um, but they're going to feel awful when this happens because I'm stopping their heart. Um, they have to be hooked up to emergency equipment. I have to monitor that heart the whole time and I have to be prepared for if it doesn't kick back in and start on its own again. After I give this, I'm gonna monitor their blood pressure and their heart rate and rhythm very, very closely. It says every 15 to 30 minutes. I'm probably going to be doing it a lot more frequently than that and monitoring it. Um, I want to teach them to change positions slowly, report any side effects. Um, this is something that we are doing um, to, you know, it's a life-saving measure. Um, it says do not use in pregnancy and lactation, but I will let you know um, that if we have to do it to save someone's life, we, we will. Um, and then last we have, the last drug in this chapter is magnesium sulfate. So we use this IV to prevent the ventricular dysrhythmia torsades de point from returning after a patient has been defibrillated, which means that they're given an electric shock. So we use this to get them back into, or to keep them in a normal rhythm. An IV magnesium sulfate bolus can sometimes eliminate torsades de point in a um, patient who is not symptomatic. Less, um, so it's a major mineral and fourth most abundant in the human body, but we use it in IV in this situation to decrease the heart muscle excitability and to eliminate that torsades de point. Um, there is more information on this back in chapter 14 um, if you need to refer back to that.